Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. Um, super, super excited to be here. And uh, Jay, thanks so much for that intro. And like we talked about, <laughs> we can uh, we can chat about Nickelback afterwards. Um, I don't know how many people are closet fans that actually want to come out, but uh, uh, I, I just remember playing a lot of basketball to that. My coach was a fanatic with Nickelback back in the day. So, anyways, um, want to tell you guys and, and and show you guys some cool things that we've learned over the past uh, couple months. And uh, some of the things I wanted to make sure of that hasn't been highly spoken about, hasn't been written a lot about. I know most of you understand the beauty and the amazingness of uh, landing page testing. Uh, you are smart enough to be uh, on this webinar. You understand uh, and you know utilize potentially a tool like Unbounce. Um, so today I wanted to switch things up and give you guys some insights as to what you can do to kind of uh, make your competitors uh, pretty sad with, with what you have going on. So um, without further ado, let's jump right into it and let's talk about the beginnings of when you guys started utilizing PPC for the first time. You remember this magical moment in your life when you're like, oh my gosh, this is PPC, this is pay-per-click, I kind of understand how it works and you were so excited to start using it. It was as if you were in love. You got to work right away. You started testing your ads, um, changing bids, adding in new keywords, changing your targeting to try to attract new audiences. But as soon as you started doing that, you also you also saw that there was a quick plateau about to happen. Um, your honeymoon phase sort of disappeared, right? You're now laying in your bed because things have changed. Things aren't like they used to be. Um, you, you don't know what else needs to be done inside your AdWords account or any PBC account for that matter to get you the results that you're looking for. Um, you're kind of finding yourself going through the motions. You're changing bids for the sake of changing them. Um, and what's going on is that you know your son who once looked up to you is now starting to doubt you. Your graphs inside of your actual AdWords account look static. There hasn't been much change. Your CPC has been the same, your CTR, the converted clicks, uh, and your click conversion rate. You just don't know what to do when in fact your dreams of everything would be so much more fulfilled if you can make your AdWords account start looking like this. Presenting and speaking at the Unbound Conversion Road Trip in New York, um, I said a thing that once you have a well-built AdWords account, 90% of your improvements will come from your landing pages. And people are like, what? Like, so does that mean that I shouldn't do anything in my AdWords account? Uh, no, not exactly, but you can spend a lot less time in it because I'll show you how that works. Um, I wrote a post for Unbounce that I think has one of the highest comment counts um, ever. And basically, post for Unbounced about what you can do inside your AdWords account to really make it shine the way it should be, establish a strong foundation. Um, and it was one of those posts that got so much feedback and people were like, oh my gosh, like this changes our entire approach to AdWords. Like, thank you so much for writing this. Um, so people are still commenting on that right now, even though it was written last year. And that 119 comments, I think it's like 100 and over, over 120 now. But anyways, look at that when you have a second. There's a URL at the bottom. It will take you right there. All right. So we were quickly talking about the way that you set up your AdWords account and the foundation of it and how important it is to actually have your search term match your keyword. Basically, your keyword is what you're bidding on, but the search term is what people are actually typing in. And sometimes these things don't match up. And when that happens, you have a high discrepancy. Inside your search term report, you basically want to make sure that the column of the added excluded basically has the green added box all the way down. The more that you have this happening, the more you see on the left hand your search term column match your keyword column on the right side. What this then does to your performance inside of the quality score issues and the cost per clicks is that things start changing up and the foundation that you built is so solid that you don't have to worry too much about making more adjustments inside your AdWords account because you built it this way. Um, what that blog post also talks about is basically the, the AdWords recipe that you're having to go through um, of what you actually need to focus on. Because again, like I mentioned, if you set it up this way, well, most of your time will now be spent on the landing page side, not necessarily on your AdWords side. These are then the things that you want to focus on on an ongoing basis. Keyword refinement, expansion, ad testing, and obviously adding negative keywords. Keyword refinement basically just means as soon as you see a search term that doesn't match your keyword and you want to bid on that search term specifically, you want to extract it from your search term report, utilize ad group level negative keywords to the old ad group it came from so that there's no internal competition. What this does to your AdWords account is that it improves the click-through rate, it increases the quality score, and it lowers your cost per click. 
it doesn't necessarily give you more impressions, but it just gets you more out of the current keywords that you're putting on. Um, on the other hand, if you were to say that your AdWords account was a hot dog and you didn't want to use only mustard and ketchup, but you want to use relish, onions, and bacon, that sounds like a delicious hot dog to me, um, you want to focus on keyword expansion, which basically means adding in new keywords or new placements that you're currently not utilizing to increase your click volume and also potentially your conversion volume. This will get you more impressions, clicks, and conversions, but it will also cost you more money, right? The, the thing that a lot of people have a hard time doing, not just with AdWords, but with any PPC, is that your PPC accounts are like a fishing boat. The more that you fish in, the more you're also overfishing the oceans, meaning the traffic and the visitors that you're getting, but you're having a really hard time selling your fish. And when I talk about fish, I mean your landing page visitors. You want to focus on the things that you can do now that you have the quality traffic coming in, a better way to have higher margins when you sell your fish and, and also have more buyers to do that as well when you get through it. Um, so let's jump right into some of these landing page hacks that we found out that kind of make a humongous difference when you focus on um, sending your PPC traffic to them. The first thing that we're going to talk about is adding more fields and more steps to your landing page. Um, people are terrified of forms. You have to give them something different than what they're looking for because people will bounce so fast. So one of the biggest things, as you guys mostly know too, is hey, if I want to increase my conversion rates, what's the fastest thing that I can do on my landing page? Well, actually lessening the amount of form fields that you have is one of the bigger things that people say that you can do. But what if you can actually do the opposite? What if you add more form fields to increase the conversion rate? Um, and I'm going against some heavy hitters when I say this. Uh, basically, Neil Patel, Pep, and then there's this third guy. I don't know if you guys know him, but I thought his picture was the prettiest of all three that I wanted to include it. But he also said that reducing the number of form fields is a one surefire way to increasing your form conversions. But what are the last final form fields you have to have to make that a quality lead for yourself? It's a way for you to communicate and contact that lead, right? So if you remove all form fields, well, the, what you have left is basically name, email, and phone number. But when a person lands on your landing page and you're only asking for that and no other questions in relation to the offer of what you're trying to sell, then they get scared. They get paranoid. And there's another thing that you have to think about, too, is that you're not their only option when it comes to what you have to offer. You have competitors that do the same thing you do. And even though you might say that you're different, in their eyes, they haven't even spent the time to see what the difference is yet because they made an adjustment um, to bounce off your landing page as soon as they saw your landing page form with only those few form fields. Um, one thing that you have to understand is that people are busy. Uh, they can go through and they don't have to speak and they don't want to speak to a ton of salespeople when they fill out that form field because they know that you're going to get talked to again. All right, so, so what we talked about real quick was your actual landing page visitors know that they have other options. Either they're too busy to, to do what you want them to do, um, or they just get bored really quick. What you have them doesn't, doesn't excite them. But there's a different way to actually get them excited to continue filling out the form or getting that conversion that you want on your landing pages. Let's take a real life example of somebody that I know. Well, actually, I don't really know her, but her name is Julie. So for the sake of this uh, exercise, let's just give her a name. Julie uh, lives in California, and she understands that um, there's a massive, massive drought going on right now, and she can't actually water her lawn uh, more than two days a week. Instead, she wants to start saving money, start saving the planet, and she wants to get some artificial grass install instead. So what she does is she goes on Google, she types in artificial grass install, she crosses her fingers that the first thing that she selects is going to actually help her out. She clicks on it, she lands, unfortunately, on an, on an actual website, not a landing page, but more importantly, that landing page has a form that doesn't have anything to do with artificial grass install. No questions asking about the size of the job, when she needs to have it happen, things like that. As soon as Julie sees this form, she leaves. And this is happening to your forms as well right now. So let's go back to Google, as Julie would do. She then clicks on the second option, the second ad that goes through. She crosses her fingers, hopefully that she'll have a better experience this time. She lands on another website, again, not a landing page, and then this is more so a direct threat to her because it has, it's asking for her most personal information, which is her name, email, and phone number. Um, but it doesn't say anything about what it costs. Um, there are some questions that Julie wants to have answered before she's willing to take the next step for you. So from this one, she goes right back to Google again. She tries then the third option. She clicks on this ad, crossing her fingers, she lands on it, 
And she's like, wait a second. This form doesn't ask me for name, email, and phone number. It actually has questions related to the offer of artificial grass install. So the square foot needed, the type of project, do you like the turf only or the and the installation? And another question that best describes her. She's saying, well, this doesn't take me any effort to fill out. There's no personal information that's threatening. What Julie thinks is that when she fills out this form, it then takes her to an actual dollar amount, a quote, for example. But what happens is Julie just micro-committed. She clicked on that, she filled it out, it takes her to the second step, and it actually gives her a reason for why she needs to fill out her personal information. If you look at what's above, and we take a backtrack, she started off and it actually had a question specifically about the offer, and then it went back to actually telling her and the reason why she needed to fill in her personal information to get that quote. Now, a thing to keep in mind with these multi-step landing pages is that if you were to take both these steps and add them on a single landing page, people will still be threatened because they know that you're asking for their name, email, and phone number, and zip code. Once you split it up and they don't understand the first step, that it's just to qualify them for you, but also to have them do that micro conversion to go to the next step, they're so much more likely to do it. Um, but keep in mind that you have to give people a really good reason to fill out that last step. And what you see above the form is usually where you make that magic happen. Specifically about what happened to Advanced Grass is when they went from a one-step um, landing page to this multi-step, over 200% increase in conversion rates, and it not only increased their lead quality, too, because there's more information to judge them off, but it helped them scrub their leads much quicker and then cherry pick which ones they wanted to focus on first, which obviously are the big jobs, and then leave the smaller ones to take after, right? Um, but this isn't an anomaly. These multi-step landing pages are here to stay. Um, another example uh, where um, an actual company decided to change a one-step landing page into a four-step landing page saw these type of numbers that you see right here. So again, um, I wouldn't be the one to tell you to do this if we didn't base our, um, if you go to our actual website, you'll notice that we ask for, for you to take a, to get a free proposal. And what you'll notice that we also have a multi-step process. The first step is basically no threat to you, right? It just tells about, asks, we ask you what your goals are and where do you advertise. The next step that you then take is a more mediocre threat. You actually have to tell us what your PPC ad spend is currently and what your website is. And then the last step is the highest threat to you. Um, where you actually have to give us your contact information so that we can send you that proposal. But again, if you notice on the top of the form on the third step, it says we're putting your proposal together, where can we send it? Um, if we were to ask all these questions in one setting, um, it, we would not get the same performance that we have right now. We actually did that prior and we had about a 1% conversion rate from all our traffic on our website to now a 5% conversion rate to people who actually initiate this pop-up to appear. So it was a big, big win for us that we did. And you might ask, well, why is that? Why do people actually do that and go through um, and, and don't do that on a single step landing page? Well, D Dr. Robert Caldini, one of the main guys who understands influence and uh, just, just the power of uh, persuasion, had a, a brilliant quote about it. It says, once we made a choice, we will encounter personal and interpersonal pressures to behave consistently with that commitment. So if you get somebody to actually fill out the first step of your landing page form, um, there's so much more likely to commit to continue that process and eventually fill out the, the last step as well. And the cool thing is you can do this and connect your forms uh, with an unbounce, uh, which is what we do as well. The second thing we're gonna talk about is um, going from really, really big redesign landing page tests to then more iterative landing page tests and, and, and actually making sure that you understand the difference between the two. Um, you want to use iterative testing to fuel new ad copy ideas and to learn about your audience. And what I mean by that is you basically have two options to go through when you do your landing page testing. You either do the hillbilly approach, which is kind of like, hey, we're going to change everything and we want to big, see big, big changes because that's what we're paying you for. Um, if you own an agency yourself or if you are currently like uh, paying an agency to do this for you, is you have to be careful of what you ask for because it might not be in your best interest. Um, it's okay to start dramatically and, and have two different redesigns going against each other and then find a winner and then make small calculated changes to, to learn what makes a difference in your landing page conversion rate. This is more the, the scientist approach because if you don't, um, you might find that some things that you changed on the landing page got better and others got worse, but when you mix them all together in one landing page, you don't know what did what. 
Another thing to consider is that if you do any programmatic ad buying or have any um, you know, conversion optimizer running or anything that's more on an automated bidding fashion, big redesigns to your landing pages can have quick negative impacts on your cost per acquisition when it comes up. You want to make sure that you take care of your robot army, make smaller changes first, learn from them, and then again, use those things that improve your conversion rates, like a new um, headline or a new testimonial or a new hero shot, to then use that for your actual ad copy and your image ads. Because if you take the Chris Jenner approach and have a ton of landing page changes done at once, um, again, you, you're not going to do a good enough job understanding what actually drove those changes. Instead, take the small green army men approach and do one thing at a time. And then be careful when you change your landing pages. Get, get super specific um, and, and make sure that when you're playing landing pages, take it as a game of operation um, and, and learn things from your audience too of what they like and what makes them excited to convert. Awesome. Next, uh, next point is something that is, uh, sits with me dearly. It's um, basically, I'm, I'm half Danish, half American, and one of the really, really bad habits that I acquired when living over here in the U.S. and then going back to Denmark was the constant small talk that we do with each other. It's like, hey, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. Um, and you find that when you go into a retail store as well is that you know, people say, hey, uh, can I help you find anything? And you're always saying, no thanks, just looking. Well, there's a completely different approach that comes to lead gen that actually works really, really well, and it is through live chat. Um, live chat, especially when you're being proactive about it, which we'll talk about, is going to be one of the bigger game changers for your lead generation landing pages that you can do. Um, and one of the reasons, big reasons why, is because people are afraid of calling you. Um, they, they don't want to go through a whole sales process. They want to know the biggest question that you know the answer to, but you don't want to give them. And it is, how much do you charge, right? But with lead gen, they can stay anonymous and they can at least start the conversation for themselves to get an answer they want while you still get what you want. Just to give you guys some ideas for the statistics uh, on the visitor side is that people get faster answers. They think it's a more efficient communication method than filling out a form and then not knowing how long it takes for you to return their call. Or even, even calling them on the phone, uh, they don't know who they're going to talk to and they don't know how long it will take either. But more importantly, you need to think of and look at the last three uh, stats uh, where people actually, when they go through and they use a live chat on a landing page, they're so much more likely to convert. If you use an e-commerce site, they're, they, they're going to spend a lot more because they feel more confident and you might be right there to answer their questions in the checkout process. And then the proactive chat, which is what we're going to talk about, is basically increases your conversion rate so much higher than what you've ever done before. And the 8x is kind of uh, in, insane to, to even think about. There's some more reasons here uh, about why live chat works so well. You can look at these uh, later. We won't go through these, but just important for you guys to, to see and understand uh, the bonuses of, of using these on your landing pages. Not only can you um, get more people to initiate a conversation that you eventually want to move towards a phone call, but you can also qualify these leads a lot quicker too. You can't have one person speaking to five different people on the phone, but you can have one person chatting with five different people uh, through through the landing page right now. So you can have a more efficient and more effective uh, lead qualification process in, in the same time as well. Now, as you go through, and I'm sure you've been aware of too, is when you come to a landing page or any website, there's this like little creepy do that just kind of pops out, out of nowhere in the beginning, right? And he always says, hey, how may I help you? But you haven't even had a chance to guess what the landing page is about or even think of what you need to know to actually ask questions. So what you do immediately is you kind of say, hey, this is of no value to me. I'm going to exit out of these right away because they don't make any sense. Um, a better approach that you guys can use if you don't have live chat yet, I mean, you definitely need to start using it if you are in the lead generation space for your landing pages, um, is to ask more questions that are faster to answer. Because when you ask, you know, how are you doing? Do you have any questions or is there anything I can help with? It can be a long answer and people are like, oh, I don't, I'm lazy, I'm not going to type that out. Instead, ask questions that have a quick answer response, meaning numerical answers or you know, short answer uh, possible answers too. And what you can do is use these automatic chat readers to ask a question to the visitor after they've been on your landing page for 15 seconds or 30 seconds. And then once they actually answer the question, now you have them and you can start asking more questions to dive deeper into what they really need and if they're potentially a good prospect for you to work with. Your end goal would then obviously be to get their, to get their contact information 
and then potentially finish the sale offline uh, via the phone. We did this ourselves, and before we did had no proactive chat greeters. Uh, we just had a kind of chat bar down at the bottom. We changed it, and the first day we started getting um, some decent uh, leads coming through. And this is just organic traffic, people who are looking to learn about um, things themselves that might not even be looking for our help. But if we can close just one of these deals, um, it would be worth so much money to us um, that, that we're excited about the potential and the continuance of split testing these questions that you're asking people automatically as they're on your landing page. The next thing is one of my favorite um, tactics to use too is inside your AdWords account or any PPC account for that matter, the more granular you are, meaning the more specific you can have between your keyword and your ad, um, the better your, your relevancy scores, your, your quality scores will be too. You're, get, you're getting a lower cost per click, your click-through rates will be a lot greater. But that doesn't translate into what you do on your landing pages. You don't want to spread yourself too thin on the landing page because if you do, well then it could be because you just enjoy waiting a lot um, for results to happen and the confidence levels that you need to get to a su successful uh, split test of your landing page could take so much longer um, because you are creating a unique landing page for every keyword that you're bidding on. There's a better way and it's almost a little bit magical. Um, basically what it means, if you're familiar with dynamic keyword insertion in AdWords, um, Unbounce offers a great solution called dynamic text replacement where you can actually change what the text is anywhere on the landing page depending on what URL parameters you create for them. Um, so if you have a specific keyword that you want to show a specific headline to, you can group all those different keywords you're bidding on to send the traffic to the same landing page and then you can test bigger things on your landing page to actually get quicker results because you're getting much more traffic instead of spreading yourself thin and having an individual landing page for every keyword. To do so, um, inside of your Unbounce account or potentially another landing page tool that you may be using, you want to look for the dynamic text um, button and basically what it looks like at the end is that your, your headline can change and again anything can change on your landing page depending on what you have as a, the parameter inside of Unbounce. So you can have stop paying foreign exchange fees, credit card fees, or child support fees. It depends on what you guys are, are wanting to do. Another thing that's extremely, extremely important is that people love the fact that you are potentially local to them. Um, it's not just what we've learned, but it's also Google's own studies that says the, the actual searches for near me has increased dramatically, and people want ads customized to their location. So let's say that you are actually um, an animal uh, pet store and you sell meow mix. Well, you know that all your clients are cats, right? But you want to get the local cl clients because those are the ones that are going to convert the easiest. So what you can do is make your ad specific and your landing page specific to have more cats reach out, click your ads, go through and actually buy um, through your landing page or, or sign up. But it doesn't just stop there. The cool thing is you can also do this with your phone numbers. Um, if you change your phone numbers and your campaigns inside your AdWords account or any PPC account you have to target just an individual city, you then make the ad copy specific to the city, you make the landing page headline or even the step head specific to that city, and then you also change your phone number to be specific to the actual area code, you will start seeing a dramatic increase in your conversion rates, just kind of like this um, chart that I borrowed from Engine Ready. Now people will want to call you and now they want to get on the phone because they trust you more. And it's not necessarily a disservice because you are, in fact, doing business local to them. You might not be an actual storefront in their city. Um, but as soon as you have them on the phone, that's, that's your job to explain that as well. Another thing that we should talk about is the difference in your landing page offer depending on your channel temperatures. So your PPC offer, basically your call to action, if it's a free consultation, a free quote, it could be a guy your white paper, they have to change depending on the traffic temperature of your actual um, PPC uh, channels. What you can find is that LinkedIn might be very, very cold traffic, meaning that they need something that's of less threat to them, a lower threatening offer than Facebook, and then Twitter can, can come warmer, and then AdWords search, because of the keyword intent behind a search engine, you know, you're ready to actually offer them a free consultation. Um, but if you do that with other channels and try and, and expect the same results, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. Some, like I mentioned, clients, prospective clients and visitors that come through on your landing page, they're going to be ice cold. They never heard about you before. Um, the offer of actually giving them a free consultation isn't going to bode well because they might not even have been looking for what you have to offer. You might have a display ad that kind of stops them in their tracks 
gets their attention, but then when they click on the ad and they go on the landing page, they're not excited about what you have to offer. They're not ready to talk to anybody on the phone. So you want to treat these people differently and give them an offer that's less threatening compared to the people who are knowing about you, who are searching for you, and are ready to get in the tub today and make that conversion happen tonight. Another way to look at this is understanding the difference of conversion actions. Um, basically, your goal will always be to create as many Chuck Norris's as, as you can. This is where the action happens, whether that be a conversion, um, a phone call, or a live chat initiation. Understand that people who are on the display side, which can be also, I would, I would call that Facebook, Twitter traffic, LinkedIn traffic, are always going to start in the awareness phase. They don't go on those social media outlets to look for your ad. Your, your ad's job is to stop them in their tracks and get them to be interested in what you have to do. But they didn't have to travel all the way around the circle to then go through and then ev eventually take action. Whereas your search visitors could start right in the consideration phase. They know that they need PPC or landing page help so they can type that into Google, they can click on our ad for example, and then they can see our landing page or our website and they can take that action right then and there and we can talk to them on the phone to see if we're a good fit. Kind of the opposite of what we did for uh, increasing the threat on the landing page side with, a, with the multi-step forms is to do the opposite for changing your offer depending on your PPC channel. You basically want to make sure that test different offers, whether it be a guide or an ebook or an infographic or something that is of value to them and make it less threatening over time. Um, so that's, that's super vital to focus on. Another thing to talk about is the post-conversion catalyst. As you know, in a lot of lead generation situations, the first conversion doesn't mean that you or your client is making money. The sale might happen offline, over the phone, or it might be a very, very long process um, that takes depending on what industry you're in. So one of the things that you want to do, um, if you've ever dealt with, with clients or, or yourself having a hard time getting a hold of your leads, saying, oh my gosh, like our conversion rates are going up, and it looks great, but like when we try to call these people back, nobody's answering. Like these are fake leads. And it's funny because a lot of people say that, and it's, it's actually not true. We're just not doing a good enough job getting them on the phone as fast as possible. So what we did instead for one of our clients was we actually changed and give people a reason to call in after they converted and fill out the form. This is a, an actual snapshot from a call rail account, and you'll notice that not only do we get a decent amount of phone calls from the different AdWords uh, campaigns that we set up in a granular fashion to match the area codes of the different places that we're targeting, but the thank you page where people have already converted is one of the biggest driving volume factors of phone calls that we're getting people to come in through. We're obviously not counting these as conversions because they've already converted once, but it's just so vital to, to, to then see the difference of how fast people can convert on your form field, and then you might take you know, 10 minutes or too long in their mind to then call back and they don't know um, they might have gotten colder, they might not have been ready anymore to, to talk to you about it. So your job is to get them on the phone as fast as possible to close a deal if you can. Um, a great example is that on the thank you page, anything that you have, you have to give people a reason to actually go through um, and want to pick up the actual phone call um, and, and give you a ring, right? Um, so give them an actual offer, maybe a countdown timer we found is great, give them an actual reason for why they have to call in because we don't um, buy more houses uh, a day than, than what they might expect is a great catalyst to kind of get them through and excited about, oh, oh my gosh, I don't want to miss out on my chance. Like, let's, let's make this happen. I'm going to give you guys a call. But even if you don't want to have people go through and call you, you might have a different type of offer where you don't want any phone, phone interaction. That's fine, too. Think of your, your post-conversion page, the thank you page, as a, a way to upsell people to continue through your process. Your, your idea and your offer to begin with might be it's not the one that you're making money off of, but eventually you want to nurture these people to continue you up the ladder to eventually become your client or whatever your end goal might be. So consider something that's of additional value to them after they've already converted the first time so that they become more affiliated with who you are, your company, and start to liking you uh, more and more as well. Because the last thing that you want to do is make sure that people don't know what to expect when they filled out the form. If you've ever tried calling people um, and you're too late for it, you didn't explain to them where, what phone number will be calling them, um, then they're not going to pick up because they completely, even though it was only two minutes ago, they already forgot that they converted on your page. Um, so you can also utilize your uh, post-conversion page to tell people, 
hey, please expect a call from this number in the next five minutes or so. Um, that's another great way of doing it as well. Last but not least, um, this is what we call the Kim Kardashian hack. And um, it's, it's basically, you're, you're, you're well aware that the importance of optimizing based off conversions and how to get more out of that. But in a lead generation situation, what you have to be careful of is doing that because it might, you might be going down a blind alleyway if you're not converting, um, or sorry, if you're not optimizing based off of sales. So a quick example of what we did um, and we saw was with one of our clients, they basically have different keyword groupings that they're going after. Um, as you remember from the Chuck Norris cycle, you have the awareness, the consideration, and then the action. Well, we grouped our keywords differently to kind of say, okay, well, the awareness side is, is kind of best coding languages. Um, and then the consideration might be somebody typing in to learn to code. And then specifically the action, like they, these guys are ready to learn a specific coding language would be learn Ruby on Rails. When we track things back into the CRM, meaning to see like, hey, what keywords are actually producing sales for the specific client, we started to see that nobody was actually buying when they typed in learn to code. We then removed that keyword from the targeting. We were not no longer bidding on it. It saved us about 20% of the actual overall budget, and there was no decrease in sales afterwards. So then we can use that budget to be more aggressive with uh, the awareness and, and the action type of keywords too. So even if you don't actually have um, a CRM, what you can do is you can still go through something called uh, Google's value track parameters or even some other um, type of tracking that you want to do custom for uh, Facebook or any other PPC channels that you have. And then just make sure that you're using on your form fields, hidden fields to capture all this information. Um, so it looks really, really overwhelming, but what you see above is what we put in the tracking template which is Google's value track parameters, and it tells us when a lead comes through and it converts, it gives us all this information, like what keyword they, they typed in, uh, what ad they clicked on, if they came through a site link, what their physical location was, uh, what the landing page URL was, and all that stuff. Then we can then go in and see, and we can compare, well, what did we actually spend on the PPC side for this specific keyword, and what did we actually make money-wise off of this keyword on, on the back end? And you don't necessarily need a CRM. You can still do this in a regular spreadsheet if you like, just to kind of get your feet wet but it's really important to, for you to see that and then also understand, well, your competitors might still be bidding on that keyword because they see that it's getting conversions, but what they're not tracking is actual sales. So you can reduce that, save your money, and, and be more aggressive in other channels where you know you're actually making money off of it. Cool, so let's recap real quick. Um, first off, start using multi-step landing pages, especially for your lead generation situation. Uh, you will find magical things happen when you do this and how much more your conversions will increase, even though everything else in the rule book tells you to decrease the amount of form fields. Not only do we want you to add more, but I'm also saying go ahead and add new additional steps to the process as well. When you are landing page testing, it's okay to start macro, meaning two major redesigns going against each other. But as soon as you find a winner, start doing micro testing and isolate certain things that actually work differently and work and learn from that. And then use that new headline or new feature and benefit to then use in your um, ad copy and, and watch the click-through rates start going up there as well. Proactive chat readers, drop the small talk. Don't be vague. Ask questions that are related to the reason why they're on your landing page. Um, don't try to be nice. Don't try to say that, hey, I'm just down here in the corner. Um, holler at me when you're ready. Actually give them a question that's easy for them and quick for them to answer and then follow up with them and try to guide them in the process of getting them on the phone, for example. Don't spread yourself too thin when it comes to landing page testing. Um, try to use, if you can, dynamic um, text insertion with a tool like Unbounce to gather all your keyword traffic onto smaller sets of landing pages instead of having a one by one. It allows you to test a lot quicker and get things done uh, a lot faster to hit the confidence levels you need to determine which are winners and which are losers. The fifth thing is understanding the different channel temperatures. You have to know that you can't have the same offer or the same call to action for the different types of PB cha PPC channels you're using. For example, uh, a PPC or AdWords search, the offer there should be different from an AdWords display offer, for example, because people are in different elements uh, when they're going through it. The post-conversion catalyst, Basically meaning, again, have to think of what you can do to get people from when they converted on your form field to actually picking up the phone or taking that next step in the conversion process. Whatever you deem that being for yourself, you have to think of, don't just say thank you, we'll be in touch shortly. Give them something else to do 
because they're ready, they're hot, they want to get an answer. So they're, they're your most primed to try to upsell or try to at least move down the conversion path. And then last but not least, we have Kim Kardashian um, with a back-end CRM sales tracking, understanding which placements and which keywords are actually producing sales for you. Don't just blindly optimize based off conversions. Um, look at the money that they're making individually for you. That's it. Thank you so much. Jade, are you, are you still there? Yeah, for sure. I've just unmuted myself. Um, and uh, yeah, we have questions coming in uh, in the midst of all those um, audio issues. <laughs> yes. No, not everybody left. That's good. <laughs> yeah. We, we do have still quite a number of ten attendees on the call right now, so we'll go over those questions first. Okay. Um, but yeah, for those of who couldn't hear anything, um, we'll have the recording sent out hopefully as soon as possible. Um, so Jonathan, um, I know you've touched upon using dynamic text for uh, landing pages built using Unbounce. Um, so for example, what are some of the good use cases when it comes to using keyword insertion? Because let's face it, not everybody can benefit from it. And right. if you do want to use it, you have to be very also careful about where you use it, whether you use it for like a phrase or just an exact word. Um, how, what do you find? So what, what, what the thing that you need to make aware of is that you are in control completely of what is swapped into the headline, for example. So when the text is dynamically changing, it doesn't mean that it automatically takes your keyword or your phrase or search term from AdWords, for example, and then just swaps it in there. Um, you are in control of the URL parameters. So once you set up that dynamic text uh, replacement, basically you go in there and you can kind of see and make sure that it fits, that it doesn't, that the headline doesn't, for example, go to two lines instead of one. So you kind of want to make sure that it that it all looks good before you start that. But you you have complete control, so there's no no worry for some things that you uh, you are overseeing. And from a use case perspective, um, what do you use, usually use it for? Is it for geographic locations? For specific, you know, keywords? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. The, so, so yes to all of those, but I'll tell you the things that we found make the biggest difference is when you dynamically change the phone number and also the geolocation of the city the person's in. Because when you're getting granular with your PVC campaigns down to a city level where you know that they might have a specific area code or obviously the city name, that has a big, big impact on the people who are trying to convert and your conversion rate. Um, but a, another thing that's extremely powerful is just a message match. Because when you have your search term match your keyword from, for example, AdWords search, and the ad is the same exact keyword, and then they click on that, and then in the headline is that exact same keyword too, that is probably the strongest like four-step message match that you can possibly do. Um, so yeah. all things combined have, have a big impact. Gotcha. Okay, and from a dynamic text replacement perspective, that the the whole goal is to try to increase the quality score on your landing page and have it optimized so that it's relevant between the ad copy that your visitors landed from to the page that they've experienced. But how important is well optimized landing pages for quality score? So it's it's obviously important. Definitely using the dynamic text replacement helps out. Um, it's not the biggest factor in quality score creation and increasing. That's more of the click-through rate between the actual keyword that the person typed in and then your ad. Um, so again, you can utilize what you learn from the micro-testing side, which is the binoculars and magnifying glass section we talked about, to increase your CTR. Because one thing that you have to keep in mind is that Google will give you a landing page score based off uh, through the quality score, and when you hover over your keyword, um, you can see like the if it's above or below average. But the thing that they can never do is understand the user experience. So the Google bot doesn't see that difference. So sometimes, and this is kind of another uh, thing that kind of goes against the grain, is that be okay to forfeit quality score just in general, not just the landing page relevance for the money that you're making. It doesn't matter, you know, don't don't get held up on the quality score if you can spend your time increasing the conversion rate instead. Okay. Um, and Don has a question around, um, he'd love to know how to do that thing where you record all of the AdWords data in the form itself. Is yeah. there an easy way to, to learn that or? Yeah, so basically um, mm -hmm. it's this link right here that you can follow where this nerdy guy was pointing. Um, I don't, can I see, still see my screen? Sorry, Jonathan, you're cutting out. Okay. Can, can you hear me now? Yep. Now it's fine. 
So if you guys can see my screen, is my screen still live, Jade? Yeah, it is. Okay. So if you go through this URL, basically through Unbounce, um, you can add in hidden fields, and you add these parameters to the back end of your final URL in AdWords um, through a tracking template. And if you want, it's, it's a little complex, um, but if you want, you can actually call Google. They can help you out. Um, most of them will be like, I have no idea what you're talking about, so just ask for um, somebody who does know, and they can help you set that up. Um, but basically, it ends up looking like this, and this is the query string above that you see in the screenshot that is included in your, uh, in your final URL. Gotcha. Okay, and circling back to the dynamic keyword insertion, um, can you use DT? I or DTR, uh, multiple ones of them under one single page, uh, or do you recommend doing that in general? Yeah, you can. So you can you can create as many as you want as far as when you change out the, the replacement. And basically, you can set the URL parameter to be different for each section. So you can have, I think the most that we ever done was the headline, the geolocation, and then the phone number. So that was three ones um, at a time on the same landing page. I'm sure you can take it further. <laughs> I don't know if you'd want to, but at least start and, and see how it goes and then and see what else you can dynamically change. Perfect. Yeah, so within the Unbalanced platform, um, even for the metadata, the description, the keywords, you can create dynamic text with those sections as well. So if you're trying to optimize your page for SEO, um, you can dynamically change that information too. Um, we have another question about the channel temperature. So mm -hmm. could you explain a little bit more about the channel temperature and what type of offers are suitable for which? Yeah, um, so it, it really depends on your industry too, right? You have to understand that if somebody is on Google search and you're bidding mm -hmm. on a keyword that is about your offer or what you're, you're looking to sell, um, because they're actively searching for it, your offer or your call to action can be more threatening. So if it is a free consultation, um, if you have an agency yourself or something something else you're doing that you're trying to get a client out of it, that free consultation might work great. But on other channels, meaning LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter, all these other PPC channels, you have to understand that you are stopping a person in their tracks with what they were doing, hopefully to get their attention to click on your ad and then you want them to go down your landing page, but now you can't offer the same free consultation as your offer because people aren't ready. They haven't even been in their mindset. They're not ready to talk to somebody on the phone. They're not actively looking for it. So you have to give them something that's of less threat to them but still valuable. So that can be a guide. It can be a white paper. Um, it can be a course of some sort, an email course. It can be a video, a podcast. I mean, I have tw over 20 ideas, basically, that you can utilize, and they're called lead magnets. So if you Google lead magnets, you can get a ton of ideas to be creative with what you can change your offer to be depending on the channel. Um, and another thing to consider is that these act as, in a sense, baits. So the more baits that you have, the quicker you can test through them, and you can see which ones work to get the person that converted to the next step in your process, you know, down to your funnel, whatever your end goal might be. Okay. Yeah. I think we have time for a couple more. Um, so Greg here has a very specific question about his oh, no. uh, eBooks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, could you touch the topic of selling paid ebooks via landing pages? Like, should we place the price of the ebook on the landing page itself, or show that information after prospects click on the CTA? Um, based on your experience, how do you find the best practice to be? Yeah. So, for ebook landing pages, even if you give them away for free, or if you give them, or if like you do actually sell them, your multi-step landing pages don't make much sense for people. Um, if it does require an actual cost, then maybe you can potentially qualify in their mind what would be some specific questions that they would want answered. Whatever your ebook offer is, um, and then the second step when they're finished and say, "Okay, you're a good candidate for this ebook. Um, here you go. Here you can buy it for seven dollars." You just have to be careful because a lot of people um, will utilize that tactic and it, it doesn't make any sense, but it's more so for lead generation and if you have that, you can basically make up any questions that you want that don't even matter to you, but for them, the visitor, it matters because you might you know, have one price on your service, but they think that they're getting like a custom price because they're going through the multi-steps. So you, you have to vary it, but you have to be careful. But think of the questions that you can ask that are in relationship to the what that ebook is about to kind of qualify it themselves, even though it actually adds more steps to uh, to your process. 
Okay. And uh, it seems like we do have a lot of questions about dynamic tech today. Um, so for Don, he, if he has dynamic text replacement on his landing page for geolocation, mm -hmm. um, does he need to have his AdWords ads specified by geolocation, or is there a way to do that? Um, yeah, great question. So you basically have to be careful that you don't show somebody for example, we're, we're out of Costa Mesa, California. If I clicked on your ad and it said, hey, Los Angeles visitor, like you should convert on my page, it wouldn't make any sense. It would actually probably deter me even more versus you not having it at all. So what you want to do is you want to get very granular in your campaign targeting within AdWords or whatever you know, PPC channel that you use and say, hey, this campaign is only targeting the people of Costa Mesa. If somebody's within that targeting range and they click on the ad, well, then they're going to see a Costa Mesa specific landing page. Um, so you just want to make sure that you have the granularity in check on, on your PPC side first, and then you can get creative with everything else. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and also for the demo portion, which I'll go over after, um, I'll briefly show how to use dynamic text within Unbounce. Um, but you do have to use it in conjunction with um, the AdWords uh, dynamic keyword insertion. And uh, one final question, Jonathan, before I take too, too much of your time, is <laughs> if you are completely new to all of this, so from landing pages to AdWords to you name, you name it, PPC in yeah. general, where do you even get started? So I would say this, um, a thing to keep in mind, this, this will help you a lot, is understand that your PBC accounts, whether it be AdWords or Facebook, whatever you use, are only your carrot to attract visitors. If you figure out that you do have quality traffic coming through, meaning you can look in Google Analytics and see the time on site or, or things like that that they're doing, uh, and you have that down, then you want to focus and, and understand that more of your opportunity will be coming on the landing page testing side of things. And the biggest, biggest game changers quickly for conversion rate would be to change like your offer, um, things like that that are relatively easy to test. It doesn't have to be super, super in-depth on, on the conversion optimization side, but um, you know, take maybe the, uh, do some, read some blogs um, about PPC in general, whatever channel that you ch decide to go after. Read the Unbounce blog on landing page testing. I mean, that is a, a gold mine. But also don't be afraid to go into the game and, and scrape your knees um, and, and, you know, get, get up, up a little bit and then go back and learn from your mistakes and, and keep kind of iterating the process. Yeah, for sure. And I would add to um, Ollie from Unbounce has written an ebook about um, what is a landing page, what you should be using it for, how you should be driving traffic to it. Um, I'll ask Steph to share the link with everyone here. But also from a PPC perspective, there are tons of free resources available on the internet from different blog posts, different ebooks that you can download and read. And even Google AdWords, their website itself, has a um, AdWords course that you can take to go into the fundamentals of different uh, pieces. Um, so there are definitely tons of information. It's more about do you have the time to go through everything. Yeah. Um, I think we're in a digital age where you know there's never that lack of information. It's just a matter of you know, what's your bandwidth like? Do you have tons of meetings? Um, you don't have time to read anything anymore? Um, that's certainly a problem with me these days. <laughs> I can never finish a book. So, yeah. Uh, with that, I believe those are the final questions, Jonathan. Um, yeah. Thank you so, so much for sticking around and going over everything. Um, for everybody who's been on the on the on webinar, it's been an amazing uh, run. But with those who you know couldn't dial in because of audio issues, again, we'll be sending out the recording uh, shortly after today's webinar.